So tell me about this competition. Okay, so um, it's called Posters on the Hill. So um, students, undergrad students from across the nation submit their research. So we submit the abstracts of kind of like what we're doing, and then we submit a little bit of ourselves in bio. My research is on peer-led team learning. So what we do at our school is um, for the first semester of general chemistry, second and organic, as well as for physics and mathematics, we took an hour away from the lecture courses. So as you can see up here, we took away an hour, and with that hour, we created workshops. So workshops are taught by undergraduate students. We divide the workshops into two one-hour sessions. So the first hour session is what we call the games. So it gives the students um, you know, the opportunity to practice problems because chemistry is a really difficult subject for most students. So they get a lot of practice, hands-on, a lot of group work, you know, peer-led team learning. So there's a lot of teamwork going on. The second portion, which is unique to our universities, the explorations, which is the wet part. So they kind of do um, a lab in a, in a way that helps them relate chemistry to the real world. So that whatever they're reading in their textbook, they're seeing in real life. Okay. So they can read it, do it, and then see it. Yeah. <laughs> From it, we have some pie charts. This is fascinating. So ever since we introduced this model into our university, we saw a dramatic increase in the passing rate. So we had the lowest passing rate that we had to use, 45 percent, and right now we're currently in the 70s. The number of chemistry majors at our university increased as well. So dear, one of the amazing things, so my background is mostly private sector, although I just joined Caltech, but we're always looking for people that can really apply what they've learned. I mean, it's the common mm -hmm. concern in STEM education. They know the theory, but they, you know, how do you turn on a light bulb, right? Sure. And Leslie represents the best of the best of this. Not only does she help students learn and learn how to learn, which you see that big increase in you know, people staying at school, but of the, the many of the 200 peer-led team learners, they're all leaders. They all have amazing careers. They've advanced, I mean, we, we come in as an advisory board, and Leslie presents to all these high-level people and thinks nothing of it. And we are always amazed that given her age, what she's able to do. And it's all about what she's learned how to do with this peer-led team learning. So we get a twofer out of it. You get the students coming through, and you're creating the real leaders in STEM education. And, you know, one of UTEP's desires is to become an R1 school. This is the sequence. Um, and Leslie's decided to go to med school, but many will be PhDs and, and come back and teach and do research. So. This is a fabulously wonderful and program. Right. And the other thing, if you're obviously learning, is a skill that isn't the unintended consequence for the other. The, the schools don't have an opportunity. There isn't an opportunity for oral communication in schools at the university level, and very few schools emphasize it. So you graduate from school yeah. without having had the ability or the or, yes. the, or the experience or you know to at, at speaking in front of groups and speaking to crowds and, and speaking to people, and, and, and that's so much a part of any occupation. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's not part of a curriculum hardly anywhere. That's correct. And so you get all of these kids have that and get that experience in speaking in front of groups. Great. Do, you, do we get to see me actually come full this out? One, two, put this up on the center's Facebook. We have pulled the students um, on where they've learned the most in terms of workshop, you know, yeah, and they, the they both said, is kind of Yeah. No, yeah. but I mean, they're great. The past well, no, grades no, no, I don't mean, last. But this is, the students are getting both the dry component and, and the wet component. component. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is I might, my guess is it's the dry component that's helping the most. I was well, wondering if there's... If I, there's think, I think it would be a little bit of both because you have to really understand something, like the basis of something. You know, you have to have a stable foundation before you can build. It so may be. Sense. It may be. Well, we got you. Hi. Hi Leslie, nice to meet you. So what we did is we integrated the workshop into it. So instead of the one hour lecture, they take a workshop that's an hour and 50 minutes. Okay. So technically not two hours, it's considered one. Okay. And so what it is, is the workshop is split into two components. We have the dry component and the wet component. Okay. Right here, you can see, since this was introduced, the number of chemistry majors at our university increased. Wow. And we've introduced a biochemistry degree, so it should be a little bit really? higher, yes. The number of chemistry majors at our school increased, and actually it's a little bit higher because we have a biochemistry degree now, so it's actually increased a little bit more. 
Now some of the students have taken chemistry in high school, really feel strongly about the workshops because it's active learning, they're not sitting in a 200 student lecture course, just, you know, taking notes. 40 years of teaching this level of classes, I wish we had a group of students like you. <laughs> oh, thank yes. you. So do, do the, you. Uh, the student leaders, do you receive any kind of uh, a stipend or yes, work study we get, or no we get paid very little but we yeah. get paid i mean no we do get paid we get paid um 10 hours a week which is the two workshops we each teach two there are 15 about 15 students in each we must hold office hours and then attend the previous session as well as the lectures okay so are you from texas or yes we're born and raised el paso el paso okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Texas girl. <laughs> Leslie, I wanted to introduce you. Jim and I know each other also. I know. Hi, I'm Leslie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm the person who started this joint activity of ICS with the posters on the hill. Oh, wow. I let you two talk. I had brought my undergraduates. I was a member of her. And when I was ACS president, I said, you know, one of my goals for my presidency is to involve undergraduates in my activities. And I said, I want to make the Public Service Award to bring the posters out because I think the legislature would love it. You're beautiful. I love, I love your university. And, and Lourdes told me she wanted me to come and meet you. And, and Jim and I, I came down to the, to the meeting that you guys had three years ago down there, and I brought my... I brought uh, 12, 13 students, 13 hours in a bus across the country from Oklahoma. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. So let me look at you. Yeah. Yes, so let me go ahead and explain to you what your workshops. The workshops consist of two components. So we have the dry, the dry component and the wet component. So the dry component is kind of like games, so that the students are actively learning, participating in a lot of teamwork. And the wet lab, of course, kind of shows the students everything they've read about in real life. So you published this yet? No. It's good stuff, man. This, this right here is really, that, that's the story. So how could uh, we get this information? I'm at the Colorado School of Mines. And we're going to have to change our freshman chemistry program because of the uh, uh, requirements of the engineering department. Okay. You need to be aware of PLTLIS.org. Do students choose to to be in a class that? No, no, no. It's, it's mandatory. It is. Yes, okay. and I have some okay. data for you all. Okay, so we pulled the students to kind of see where they feel like they learn the most. Okay. Mm -hmm. The yellow portions. Would you like them, sir? The yellow portions are the workshops. And as you can see, if you turn it around, most of the students learn most of their stuff in the workshops. So, and that's just because they're up and about, they're running, they're participating, it's all teamwork and they're not sitting there listening to a professor speak and speak and speak, yes. you know? And it's been greatly beneficial for the peer leaders. We've kept track of 201 of them, and they've, most of them have gone on to graduate, um, graduate school, med school, dental school. So it's been very beneficial at our university, which is Valerie. Right. So, oh, very interesting. Yeah. So, this is, so is this a model then? So now it's gone to, what, five classes? Yeah. Can you use this? Yeah, and so on Mondays, the professors will be like, I'm covering this certain chapter up to here. Make sure you touch upon this because students have difficulty. So on and so forth. At the end of the week, we talk about what worked and what didn't work. Because we have freestyle at our university, so each peer leader can go about teaching a certain part of chemistry, however they are like. these peer leaders paid? Yes, we're paid. We're paid 10 hours. So we have two two-hour workshops. We must attend the previews, they're mandatory, the lectures, and we have office hours. And we make up our own quizzes, our own homework assignments, our own everything. So we really so, um, so the supervising professor then instead of instead of teaching three lectures, is only doing Teach two. two. Mm -hmm. But then also supervising the workshop peer leaders. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can get a, a photograph. <laughs> Thank you. 2012 American Chemical Society Award for Public Service.
I truly believe that one of the most important things we're doing in this country for our future is STEM education. It's important we need more STEM majors, we need more STEM, we need more people in technology, education, math, engineering, and science. We need in all different areas. We need more people to get, to get involved in this. We're going to be successful because down the road, when you look at the opportunities, many of the opportunities are going to require people that have STEM degrees, much more than in the past. So if we're going to be successful as a country, we have to have a workforce that has STEM education. And not only that, we need to provide jobs. They're going to give people good, satisfying jobs at good pay, and they're going to be the STEM jobs. Final piece I'd say is that one of the things we don't concentrate enough on when we advocates of STEM education is something I learned working with council. Sure, we need more STEM majors, but you know, over 60% of the people who are going to have good jobs in the future are going to need some kind of STEM skills. If you go out to Apple, and Apple's a big issue now with jobs. You're going to find a lot of scientists, a lot of technology, a lot of engineering, a lot of math. But you're going to find a lot of English majors too. Because a lot of the work that's going to have to be done is going to be done by people. And it's extremely helpful for those people that have the same background.